chapter 2 as we continue our little series we have going here on First Timothy chapter 2. We've made our way down now to the verses here in um, verse 8 through 15. We've been told, as I continue to remind you, that there's one God, one mediator between Christ, I mean between man and God, and that's Jesus Christ. He gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Paul is ordained a preacher. And then we have the great therefore in verse 8, I will therefore... Since God desires all men to be saved, and since He sent Jesus Christ to be the Savior, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Do we have notes? Everybody have notes? Okay, you're, you're getting notes now as I preach. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. I tell you, people need to be saved, and if God's accomplished the salvation, how important it is that we pray that they be saved. I mean, if we pray for your crop to grow, if you pray that you have a job tomorrow, if you pray that you don't have a cold anymore, then God forbid that we refuse or forget to pray for people to be saved. Because that's one of the most important things in the universe, isn't it? Well, for our prayers to be answered, men, and notice you need to get the ball rolling here, I will therefore men, if something's wrong in your home, man, I mean, you've got to get the ball rolling there. You need to be the one that stands up and does something about it. Amen? There's no Bible reading in your home. Uh, he didn't say, I will therefore women. He says, I will therefore men. So let's ensure that we're men in our homes and in our churches and in society. And Make sure that we're lifting up holy hands. God likes worship, but He wants worship to be with holy hands, right? Holy hands. Without wrath and doubting, without wrath in our hearts, bitterness toward one another, and He wants faith in our prayers. As we pray, faith in God. In like manner also that women... Now notice what it says about women. When it comes to prayer in the assembly, and of course at all times, but especially as we come together in prayer in the assembly and we have corporate prayer, women ought to be adorned. Adorned means to make yourself beautiful, make yourself pretty, uh, adorn themselves in, but not a harlot's apparel that we've been finding over in Proverbs chapter 7, not the attire of a harlot, but... I will therefore that women adorn, make yourselves beautiful in modest apparel. And we studied intensely that word modest, modesty, and uh, which simply means not meretricious. The word meretricious means uh, like a harlot. So it's very simple. Your Bible telling you as plain as it can possibly tell you, women adorn yourselves, but not like a harlot adorns themselves, but like a holy woman would adorn herself. In other words, dress according to your profession with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women. See, some women love to get out and, and they think that if it's very expensive, see, if it's in style and very, very super expensive, I got mine at whatever, whatever, Dillard's or wherever it goes, I, you know, look what I'm wearing. And uh, the women at that time, the um, courtesans, the prostitutes in that day and age would adorn themselves. And we showed you a picture of some of those last week. And Paul's telling you plainly, look, women, when you go to pray, when your church goes to pray, listen now, it's very important that when you gather together that the women, if these prayers are going to be answered, uh, you keep yourselves adorned in this modest apparel. God does not want the women looking like prostitutes when it's time for prayer. Uh, and He doesn't want you looking like that at any time. Turn it down just a little bit, brother. Thank you. But He tells you in verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good work. So, in other words, He wants you to dress like the godly mother, godly wife, and 
And um, that's important. Well, we're living in the last days, and there's a lot of perilous things happening in the world today. I just got a report there's tornadoes in Israel. That's a total new thing, isn't it? I mean, they're like, we've never seen such a thing ever. Boy, you're talking about Bible prophecy uh, uh, getting ready to be fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I mean, you see the, the strange things that are happening. You see the horrible, horrible situation much of the world is in. And uh, it's time that we start getting serious about our religion. It's time we start getting serious about the things of God and quit these games that are being played in the name of Christianity. We need prayers answered, don't we? Well, man, let's get rid of some wrath and let's get rid of this lack of faith that we have and let's start taking manly authority in our homes and in a godly way, stand up for God. And, and let's, uh, women, let's start getting rid of the harlot clothing and the dressing like harlots that we've seen so much uh, in churches today. And we started this off about adorning. It's time for women to look like women and adorn themselves and love their husbands, look beautiful for their husbands. That's an important thing. It's time for preachers to quit holding back in a lot of things that they've been holding back in. See? And they're so afraid. I think it really relates to the whole passage here. Men need to quit being so afraid to stand up and do what's right. That's what's wrong with our churches today. I commend a lot of black preachers because there's a, uh, a, 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 a news report that just came out that says uh, black preachers are attacking the gluttony, obesity epidemic among black women in their churches. So, Paul, uh, 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 Brother Lewis, how can I be a black preacher, brother? What can I do? I, I'm trying to do it here, brother. I'm trying to say what needs to be said, see. But uh, I, I praise God for men that are starting to stand up, amen? They're just starting to stand up and say what needs to be said. No more of just kicking back from the pulpit and, you know, trying to be nice. And, and we should be nice. But you know what? Meanwhile, the women are dressed like harlots. Meanwhile, we're sitting there. Our prayers aren't being answered. And nobody's being saved. Our communities aren't being taught. Uh Cynthia, after one of my sermons there on this text, um, she gave me a little newspaper ad here from, I guess, Star Telegram. It says, uh, dressing to thrill a societal slip up. This thing's just a secular woman is saying, which is more depressing? It's hard to say. The fact that teenage girls have rolls of flab around their waist or the fact that they let flesh hang over the tops of their low-cut jeans exposed for the world to see. It seems that the richer America gets, the trashier the young people look. A lot of that's inside our churches. I mean, these, these are secular folks saying, why is everybody dressing so trashy? Isn't that amazing? So she goes on to talk about some other things. That, uh, I just think uh, th th there are some folks that are, even if they're not saved, realizing that something's wrong today. But you know what? It's been gone so far. There's no reason to give up. And I'm not calling us to give up. Otherwise, I, I'd go on and preach about something else. I'm not telling us to give up. I'm just telling you that um, this thing needs to be emphasized properly. Because it's so gone that um, only severe preaching in the way it needs to be preached is going to set this thing right. And uh, it can't just be in one church. It's got to be all around the country. But each person's got to do their part where they're at. As boys are growing into manliness, you know, they're at that awkward age where sometimes their voice hasn't changed yet. Their frame is not bulky with developed muscles. And you know that at that age, male homosexuals prey upon the young boys. Uh, one of the reasons they prey upon them is because they're young and impressionable and often easy to manipulate. And uh, that's a sad thing, you know. Especially boys that are raised without supervision and training. 
But we're reaching a state in society where the Bible says that even the women go back. And you know what Paul says about that? That's pretty much the bottom of the barrel. When finally the women of a society go bad, it has pretty much been turned over to judgment. That's what it's been turned over to is judgment. I don't know if you've been watching World Net Daily or some other news reports, uh, but there is a literal epidemic of female teachers preying upon boys. I, I, I'm talking every day there's four or five of them that they busted around the country. School teachers. Every day it's another school teacher somewhere in America. No, there's about three. Every single day in America that get busted in some state of America um, for this epidemic of preying upon young boys, 11 years old. And I'm telling you something by this. These women are simply a sign that many women today are losing, listen now, their natural affection and are becoming unnatural. As women lose their femininity in various degrees, it causes them to be attracted to that which is feminine instead of that which is masculine. And in a young boy, the masculine, the masculinity is there, though it's blurred as he's growing. That's why young boys are a target for both sides, because the women that are unnatural see in them the the, the, the masculinity, and, and they're an easy target of manipulation, and the homosexuals see in them an easy target, and see in them some type of perverse femininity, and you see the, the whole confusion that we have today. A man that is masculine is attracted to that which is feminine. And if a man wants his wife to be boyish, something's wrong in his heart. I like you when you look like a boy. Well, what's wrong? What happened to you? Somewhere along the... You, you may not be a homosexual, but something is going wrong. In, you know, talk about chemical imbalance, man. There's some things. I, I mean, you're becoming microsoft in the brain. Something's wrong. And they're right, brother. And if a woman is attracted to boys and preys upon them, something's wrong. So you need to start out by understanding that everything that is natural is not moral or holy. I'm not saying that. You should just touch it. But listen now, immorality soon breeds unnatural perversion. So I'm telling you that everything that is natural is not right, but you, you need to understand that When you begin to do things that are natural, though they're sin, you soon end up not only in sin, but doing sins which are unnatural. It's the progression. You begin with natural sins, and you end with unnatural sins. The so-called scientific revolution, as I said, brought us the new monkey morality, which was the sexual revolution of the 20th century century, scientific revolution brought into sexual revolution, the monkey morality, and uh, which basically said that if, if, uh, if we came from monkeys, then we might as well study monkeys to see how we're supposed to run our homes. Uh, well, now that the 20th century has begun, we've entered the age when the Bible says society or civilization falls in divine judgment. So you get scientific revolution. We're becoming so smart. No, you're not. I mean, you had a little bit of intelligence before when you believed you were uh, created by a creator, but then when you start thinking you come from eternal mud and you're just a glorified monkey, now something's wrong. So mankind became foolish. Remember, that's what it says in Romans. It says they became foolish. Well, that's the scientific revolution of the 1800s. Man became foolish. Well, then what happens after that? Now he, has, uh, he gets turned over 
into a sexual revolution, and now he's in a perverted revolution. Now we're in the day and age of perversion, and now once we end up there, the bottom of the barrel is the women go bad. And when the women go bad, it's over. Bye. Romans 1. For this cause God gave them up into vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Even their women. Why would it say even their women? Because women aren't supposed to go bad. See, Women are fallen just like men are. But they're the last final preservation of all that is good, holy, beautiful, and sacred. Do you see that? It used to be that if men were starting to get, get, get a little out of hand, when the woman walks in the room, everything gets back normal and right. See? Whether it's the wife, the daughter, the mother, the aunt, it doesn't matter. There was respect. Something different has walked into the room. It's a lady. And if you didn't straighten up your mouth and straighten up your attitude, somebody would knock you off your chair. Now, you need to understand, there was a time when women or men could be reasonably trusted with children. Do you realize that in this latter part of the 20th century, men could no longer be trusted with children? I mean, the way we design our bus ministry, it's been designed according to a fallen society. I, I mean, I remember not long ago, I was a teenage camp counselor. But I had kids all around. I took kids by myself way out in the woods when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. God forbid, I don't think it's right, but I took girls out there in the woods and camp, and, and, and it wasn't right. I don't think that's right. But it was all pure, holy, sitting around a campfire. I mean, I can't imagine such a thing today. The latter part of the 20th century showed that, no, you can't trust men. Or you don't want to trust your child with men. I, I don't believe that all men are bad. God forbid. I believe the godly men in this church are fine. But, but you don't want to risk a lawsuit. You don't want to risk accusation, etc. So you understand what happened to a lot of ministries at the latter part of the 20th century. But hold on a second now. In the 21st century, we've entered an age. It's barely just begun. And we have an epidemic that is telling us you can't trust women with children. What, what is society going to do? Do you know the Department of Homeland Security? Uh, the, one, one of the, the big officials in the Department of Homeland, you know, Big Brother, Fatherland, Homeland Security. He just got busted for uh, trying to uh, uh, proposition a young 14-year-old girl. Thank you, Homeland Security. He was calling up everybody. Oh, you wouldn't believe. You ought to see my ID. Wow, you ought to, I'm like vice president. I'm like the spokesman of Homeland Security. Boy, you ought to see all this stuff as he preys upon minors. But that's nothing. He's a man, huh? God forbid that sure doesn't mean he's free to do whatever he wants to do. But I'm just saying, you don't expect the women to go back. You don't expect to open up the paper every day and somewhere in a country three women have been busted somewhere in an elementary school class for praying upon young boys. And everybody is starting to say, what's wrong with our society today? What happened? Whether it's a desire in these women to be in control. See, that's a responsibility given to men to lead and be in control. So whether they like being in control in this perverted way or whether they see in these boys an undeveloped state of manliness which is a semi, in their mind, some type of perversion 
androgynous perversion. I don't know. But what I do know is this. Everything them old, bearded, fundamental preachers said would happen to America has happened a lot quicker than they said it would happen. You can read these old men and see exactly what they said back in 1910, 1908, 1899, 1920. You can see what they said and you can see the New York Times and these folks writing and saying, oh, listen to these old crazy buddy duddies you know, that they think the whole world's going to fall. They think we're going to fall over into some paganism like in ancient Rome and we're going to go back to that sexual impurity of that day and age just because we're dancing. We're just da- dancing to a little jazz boogie woogie music, you know. That's all we're doing. And they're telling us that the world's going to end. They're telling us that we've lost our children. You're going to end up with homosexual children. You're going to end up with women preying upon children. They're telling us all of that. Can you believe it? And all, all these psychologists and all these quacks says, oh, <laughs> we're so dignified. We're so bright and enlightened. Can you believe what these old country buddy buddies are telling us? The end of the world. We're going to lose all of our children. They're all going to be perverts. Oh, yeah, like that's really going to happen. Friend, don't you think God is mocked? Don't you think that you can sit in front of preachers quoting you the Bible verses? with God's authority behind them. And don't you think you can walk contrary to that Word of God and not receive exactly what God says you're going to receive? We've lost the distinction between male and female. And boys are in the middle of it all, attacked by both sides. There's the story of the female country western singer, Charlene Arthur. In 1955, she was voted best female singer right next to Kitty Wells. So she was second in all of America as the greatest country singer of all time. See, I'd never heard of her. She wrote, I don't wear gingham dresses, but I wear slacks. Wow, that was amazing in 1955. She says, I was boogie woogie in whatever that means, long before Elvis was. She never had a hit, and she ended up in the honky tonk. But all along, we find out later that she was a homosexual. Now, everybody that wears pants is not a homosexual, but I'm going to tell you something. The devil's already begun operating upon your life. Just as as a man who starts wearing girly stuff, there's already been some type of operation that the devil's begun. See? It's already begun in your life. He's already begun to blur things. See? I've already documented, and I'm not going to repeat that sermon, but I... But because I, I got a different angle for you tonight, but I have documented, and I want you to remember it, that there is an occult, occult conspiracy. And the occult conspiracy consists of Luciferians, people that worship the devil, worship Lucifer. We call him the devil. They don't call him the devil. They call him Lucifer. But these are theosophists, people that think Lucifer is the good guy. And these are the New Agers, the folks behind the Aquarian conspiracy, the folks that are behind these rock stars, the folks, these globalists, these, these, these secret society organizations, see. They're a cultic organization, these Masonic organizations, see. They have an agenda, man. Don't you think they don't have an agenda? Don't you think this Harry Potter all around the world, a uh, 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 billion of books, don't you think that's not an agenda, that something is behind this music, that th- these books? There is an occult agenda preparing the world for Antichrist. Now, you didn't just wake up one day. All of, no, no, this stuff's been going on. And part of their agenda is Scrambling the sexes so you lose the difference between men and women. And I've quoted Anna B. Kingsford, the occult writing, the perfect way, who, quote, who, who quotes a Gnostic work uh, from early, uh, uh, the, the early days, 
right after Christ it says the kingdom of heaven shall come when you women have renounced the dress of your sex. What they call the kingdom of heaven, the Bible calls the kingdom of who? Antichrist. So they're looking. The world's been waiting for thousands of years. Uh, ever since the, the, the devil said, look, I'll give you that third eye. I'll, I'll give you your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God. Ever since he's offered that to Eve and all these mystery religions, he's been preparing the world for his day when he gets to rule the world, see, through his man, the son of Satan. And if God's kingdom says, women, adorn yourselves modestly. It is an abomination to wear that which pertains to a man. It's an abomination for a man to wear that which pertains to a woman. I want everything in its right place. Because if God says, I want this right here, and I want this right here, and God says, it is good. The devil says, no, no, we're going to put this right here, and this right here, and now we say, that is good. God says, I say that's upside down and perverted. They say, no, we say, you're upside down and perverted. And you see, they are contrary one to another. The Antichrist kingdom says, women, renounce the dress of your sex. God's kingdom says, women, adorn yourselves with beauty and modesty. Remember Shipton, old lady Shipton there? Back in uh, the early 1600s, I suppose. She said one day, I, I, I gave this to you, but it's so important. I like to share it with you from time to time. The great preacher, the great preacher that uh, launched so many missionaries and raised so much money, Oswald J. Smith, quoted her in 1927. Because in 1927, uh, things were starting to shake, you see, in the roaring 20s of that day. But he quoted Chip then and said, isn't it amazing that we're starting to see exactly what she predicted according to the Bible, we guess. Here's what she said, For in those wondrous far-off days, and I remember she's about 400 years before this time, the women shall adopt the craze to dress like man and trousers wear and cut off their locks of hair. They'll ride astride with brazen brow as witches do on broomsticks now. Then love shall die and marriage cease and nations wane as babes decrease. You study what's happening in Japan. You study how they're paying people to have children now. See? The wives shall fondle cats and dogs, and men live much the same as hogs. As, as women leave the nurturing of children, they begin to have to nurture something. So they begin raising cats and dogs, see. And, and they begin to treat them like little babies, see. I mean, a righteous man careth for his beast, and that's fine, but, but they've gone beyond caring for their pets. There's this maternal instinct that's not being fulfilled and, and, and they're fulfilling it on their little puppies and cats and things like that. In 1926, well, she even predicted when it's going to happen. You say, well, that had to be from the devil. Well, maybe it was. But understand that it was common knowledge in that day and age that the world would end somewhere around the year 2000. So if you just back up a few generations from the year 2000, uh, it's possible to come up with that number. But those that live the century through, in fear and trembling, this will do. I tell you, war, world war after world war, for storms will rage and oceans roar. You've seen the tsunamis when Gable stands on sea and shore. And as he blows his wondrous horn, old world shall die and new be born. That's something, isn't it? I tell you what, that's quite amazing for 400 years ago. That's quite amazing, isn't it? Um. Uh, for this reason, we must establish again the foundation. The Bible says that if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? You must restore. You say, God, what do we do? What's happening? We're trying to handle it. You're just dealing with the symptoms, friend. You must get to the foundation of the problem. Things like the fear of God. In the beginning, the fear of God. Uh, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom is fear. So, Fear is a foundational thing. Without fear, you can't restore anything. That's why the kingdom teaching it is foundational to bringing everything back like it should be. The church is a pillar. Uh, it, it, it must be there, see? But a church, 
Uh, the Bible says is a pillar and ground of the truth, and He's showing us here in Timothy how to behave ourselves in the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You have to have church. Church is so important in our life. We must have our families come together corporately in corporate worship with the women modest and the men taking control and authority in the way that they're supposed to. We must have that in godliness. But hold on a second. How can you have a godly church without godly families? Churches are made up of families. And God said in the beginning He made them male and female, not Fred and Ted. He made them male and female. That's foundational, isn't it? The family is foundational. So God's saying, look, if the foundation, if the fear of God, what a godly church is. What You need to go back to the family. You need to go back to church. You need to go back to things that are foundational. The fear of God. The holy Word of God. What can be more foundational than the Word of God? We need the preservation and, uh, of the Word of God. And we need to teach it and believe it. I'm telling you something, friend. If we don't fix the foundation, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. We must go back and fix the foundation. And I'm saying families are messed up. And we fixed a lot of it, praise God. Mamas are back home with their children, and families are thriving, babies are being made, and praise God, children are thriving, they're doing good, things are... Uh, that's how it should be. And we want more of it. But if we don't teach what mama is and what daddy is, and we don't teach... 13-year-old boys, this is mama and this is daddy. And we don't say, this is what a woman looks like. This is what a man looks like. If we don't do that, then, then, then we're not fixing the foundation. When a foundation has been destroyed, it has breaches in it. That's an old English word. Breaches, by the way, in your Bible is the old word for breaches. God says you have to fix the foundation because it has riches in it. Now, if you need to fix the foundation because it has breaches in it, and it says Amos 9.11, in that day when the millennium comes, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that it falls, falls and close up the breaches thereof. What's God saying? He's saying revival comes when bridges are closed up where they shouldn't be. We've got a breach in our definition of church today. In what church should be. It's all been breached. There's holes in it. It's become a house of entertainment. You need to fix the breaches. Get rid of the breaches. Amen. Get rid of them. We've got problems with the fear of God. It's been redefined. Nobody should fear God. There's a breach in the doctrine of the fear of God. I say get the breaches out. See? And I believe when women have breaches, I don't believe that leads to revival. Because I believe they're where they shouldn't be. And skirts and dresses with large rips or slits are brief. When women walk around, even if you don't have pants on, if you're walking around in a skirt and that skirt's poor in a way it shouldn't be, that's a brief. How can you have revival unless we fix the foundation? And unless you get women fixed, how's the family going to be fixed? And unless you get a family fixed, how are you going to get churches fixed? Do you realize what's wrong with churches? They sit around and say, well, that's just these families. I can't do anything about them. Well, I know. So unless the families get sick, and Deacon Tom and whoever he is, Usher Fred, goes home and gets his home in order, the church isn't going to be in order. And the foundation is still going to be ripped out. It's still going to have holes in it, problems. You say, Pastor, why did they ever, why did women ever wear skirts to begin with? Modest church. Well, if you ask a Jew, not that he knows anything special, but, but uh, uh, some of them Jews that, that, that still dress in that way, uh, they tell you the same way anybody that studies modesty will tell you to hide the shape of the woman. The form and shape of a woman is revealing and tempting to a man, so it hides it. 
and says, that's something sacred. That's something uh, that only the husband should see. And so we're going to hide the thing. Riches don't do that. Riches show you too much. They show you things you don't want to know about your brother's wife. Amen. To reveal the shape of a woman's meretricious. And we saw that. Do you know clothing is designed to make a statement? There is the functional aspect. In other words, what do you do for a living? You ought to dress that way. And, and in the big picture, women are supposed to be homemakers and they're supposed to function as that part of society, so they need to dress according to that function. And... Um, In other words, they're not to dress as blacksmiths or welders and things like that. No man wants to come home and his wife's all dressed up like a blacksmith or a welder. But there's more. Women are to represent not just homemakers, but that which is refined and chaste and beautiful. They represent all that is a flower in life. They represent everything that's chaste, pure, Graceful. They are to be the flowers, the mothers, the daughters, the grace and charity of life. That's why women are to be honored and respected. They are to be put on a pedestal. They're not to be cheapened. There is an element of dignity about women. There's an, ele- there's an element of dignity and beauty and grace that Brother Orlando don't have. When Orlando walks in the room, I don't say, wow, that's just beautiful. I don't say, how graceful and dignified. I mean, you just don't do that. But women are lovely. Brother John Christie, you're not lovely, man. You're my friend, brother, and I love you, but you're just not lovely. Brother Sam's not lovely to me. I don't look at Sam and say, oh, how lovely and graceful and dignified. No, I don't. This is why women are to be covered in clothing that speaks of their noble, graceful position. As queens, they are to be protected, defended, honored. Not just the mother, wife, and daughters, but all women in our society. It used to be when a man said, hey, there's a woman who wants to find out how can I help her? How can I protect her? How can I, how can I be her strength? Little ones were taught from an early age, when you see a woman, that's something dignified and elegant and graceful and noble. See if you can help her carry something. Respect her. Open the door. Say, yes, ma'am. But what has occurred today? I want to ask you something. What has the universal nakedness of the female brought to modern man? You know what it's done? It's removed all the awe, the mystery. You know what it's done? It's cheapened women into a shameful toy. It's removed women from her special throne that she had in all societies at all times. You say, well, they made them carry a lot. Yeah, they made them carry a lot. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. Whatever Indian or whatever tribe it was, yeah, they made them carry a lot. But I'm going to tell you something. They, they, they treated them as elegant, friend. They protected them. They loved them. They were something elegant in their society. And you've got to understand that many of these folks did not have fullness of life. They may have had a piece of conscience that told them that women should be here and men should be here, but without the Christian virtues, without the Holy Ghost, without these things, uh, that they only got close to those ideals. See, they weren't able to achieve God's 
standard of righteousness. But now that you have universal nakedness, she's no longer respected by many men. In fact, women are seen as one of the boys. And you know what? There's women walking around that have been led by feminists that believe that now that she's accepted as one of the boys, that that's a promotion. That's not a promotion. You were on a pedestal, and now you're seen as one of the boys? That's sad, isn't it? And women often live the part. They're loud and brawling like a bear of a man. They're seen about not in their house. And now men go out into society and they have to deal with women on a day-to-day, dog-eat-dog, competitive world. That's not right. That's not normal. She now sits in the gate, dressed like a man, pretending to be a man, or at least a harlot. Now listen to me, young men, raised on video games and a 12-pack and HBO. That's what they know. That's their church. Where women have been day to day at 3 o'clock in the morning at night on TV, at 8 o'clock in the morning on TV, wherever they're at in whatever movie, constant video game after constant movie, after constant whatever, women have been portrayed as objects, toys, and one of the boys. Now, I want to show you something about society now. Anytime one of these little boys begins to treat women in that way, the way that he's been taught from the time he's young to treat women. Somebody comes and says, Andrew, remember, she's a lady. You know what young boys say to that? Ma, what's a lady? Is that some type of bog? What is a lady? I've never heard of such a thing. See, society's still trying to keep boys Young college boy. Still wanting to somehow teach those boys to respect women. But they devalued women in society. And woman being a weaker creature physically, she's now left praying to the brutal instinct of these unrestrained boys. Ma, what's a lady? Well, you know, son, treat her like she's the weaker vessel. Give her special honor since she's a weaker vessel. Ma, I've been in a lot of trouble for that type of language. I've been taught ever since I was in kindergarten that they're not weaker vessels. They are in every respect equal to me. In fact, I've been taught, Ma, that there's no difference at all between a boy and a girl. And you've always dressed like Dad and yelled at him like he was on your level or under you. I guess I don't understand how I'm now to treat women like they're special. Special my foot. Of course, having a young man that treats women badly is the least of the problems that result from women leaving their modesty and modest garments. You have dominating, pants-wearing women that try so hard to dominate in their homes and they put down manliness and they end up plucking it up out of the lives of their male children. That little boy growing up heard one thing, manliness is evil. If you're you're manly around this home, Mama's going to punch you in the mouth. You can't be manly. So what happens to little boy? Little boy grows up thinking that the worst thing I could do is be manly around Mama. He must be dominant. And Mama likes the fact that as the young boy grows up, he's still dependent on Mama. 
And Mama's going to be there like, Daddy, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be the provider for you, son. Little boy never grows up to be a man. Little boy's taught that if I ever act like a man, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. So what happens to these boys with dominating Mama? They grow up self-conscious and afraid, timid little creatures. Frail creatures. And if Mama can't dominate Daddy, she'll dominate little Johnny. And when Daddy goes off to work and she's cussing him out, she'll grab him by the ear and say, Listen here, you little punk. You're not going to tell me what to do, see? I take enough of it from your Daddy, and I'm sure not taking it from you. See, now I don't believe boys are to smart off to their Mama. But I do believe that there, in our culture today, there's this overreaction to the manliness in a young man that's causing them to be frail, little petite creatures, self-conscious, homosexual. There's a war that has been launched. And women have come out and said, we're going to conquer it. And they're coming out hitting like a man. I grew up in Foxfire Apartments for a time. You didn't have black, white, whatever. We were all just, none of us had daddies. We were all just stuck in the same apartments, you know. Back where I was from, I was, you know, it was still kind of racially se segregated, but not there it wasn't. It doesn't matter where you come from, man. None of us got daddies. That's just, you know, at least living with us. But there were, uh, I told you the story about Paula, the black girl, that would go around beating up and bullying all the boys there. And, and if you were playing football, you wanted Paula on your team because she wore pants, she dressed like a man, and she could throw a football further than just about every man in the apartment. So you wanted her on your team to so replay tackle things. And you wanted her because she could tackle harder than anybody. He was a mean time boy. Cigarette smoking mean time boy. One day Jimmy and Paula got in a fight. I told you the story, I'll tell you again. Paula stuck her finger up and said, I'm going to tell you right now, you better get out of my face. He said, you're the one in my face. I'm not doing anything. So he tried to walk away. He went over and got in his face again. They said, you're scared of me, aren't you? He pushed me. I remember it like it's yesterday. Pushed her. I, I continued pushing her, continued pushing her. said, you don't want to fight. You know, I'll, I'll whoop you, right? She used a different language. And finally, he said, Paula, uh, you know, you, you've been basically acting like a boy ever since we've known you. So I'm going to treat you like a boy. And he hauled off and knocked her one time. He started crying. Now, everybody told that boy, what you did was wrong. Why did you hit that girl? And he said, why did she, why did she act like a boy then? And Paul was crying. That's for somebody ever seen her cry. Ever. Ever. But I'm going to tell you something. What caused the young man to react with such brutality many decades ago? It was something called the new woman. The new woman says, I'm not sacred. I'm not on a pedestal. I'm no different than you. And since you don't take this from Fred, you ought not take it from me. And the boy's confused and he says, well, that's right. If Fred ever did that, I'm going to pop him in the nose. And now you're coming and doing this, so I'm going to pop you in the nose too. He's just confused kid. You see that? North Carolina soccer team. brutalized some women a few weeks back who had danced at their bachelor party. Society is appalled. They're like, what's happening to our boy? What's happening to our college kid? The boy said, those weren't women. You want me to respect those women? The boys are confused. They're brutal little untrained savages. But you must understand what they're thinking in their minds. They've been raised 
to think they're special. They have a right to whatever they desire. They need to protect their self-esteem like it's some sacred cow or something. They've been raised with thousands of images that teach them that women are objects, women are objects, women are objects. And women have told them, if you have sexual beauty like us, you might as well show it and you might as well use it to get somewhere in life. And boys say, well, I don't have any of that. But boys say, well, wait a second. I've got something you don't. I've got a bicep a lot bigger than yours and I've got shoulders bigger than yours and I can make you do whatever I want you to do. And the boys start realizing, wow, I've got power. And our philosophy says, do whatever you want to do. And so these young boys are saying, hey, I've got power, raw, man, masculine power. I'm going to use it. If you can use your power, I'm going to use my power. We've got perversion today, friends. Now we've got young men walking around like brood apes. And so the woman starts trying to use her sexual beauty, but she finds out it does not charm the beast. It does not refine him. It only makes him far more savage. As the ten kings kill the harlot and burn her with fire, so has modern man lost his mind to the hurt of women. You know what the man, you know what the, you know the, the attitude they have? If any news report that comes out, you read what the man says. He says, well, if they didn't want anybody to take it, they should not have advertised it. That's the modern man today. You say, well, he's a sick, perverted creature. I know he is. But something in our society is raising sick, perverted creatures. Too. Just the other day, a man was busted. Because he drove his car down the road and saw a woman jogging, so he stuck his hand out of the car and grabbed her. These are the men of today. Not all men are turning into mad rapists. The other half are becoming sodomites. Well, maybe not the other half, but there's a lot. If a man's not turning into a brutal mad rapist, he's turning into a sodomite or something in between. Then there's another class. He says, well, I'm not going to rape them and brutalize them and murder them, but uh, I still see women as something to use, something to live off of until she has an emotional day and throws a fit in a tantrum and walks out. And then I laugh and go live with another girl. That's the mentality of the modern young man today. Living with a girl until she kicks him out and then he finds another one to live with and then he smiles and prays upon another the whole time thinking women's lib is great. It's not that bad at all. I mean, sad because the women have taken his job and that type of thing, but really, the way he views it, wow, if they want to work and support, that's fine. I'll sit at home watch TV with the entertainment center and a beer in my hand. Whole time encouraging her, saying, you can do it, sweetie. You can do it. Go, yeah, you can go get that promotion. Go get the promotion. You can do it. You can now hush up for a second. I'm watching HBO. Bringing this home, let me ask you a question. There was once a time when women were safe in the home. Do you know that? You can keep your door unlocked in America. There was a time when women were largely safe on the street. Did you know that? Women could walk down the road, go to the store, do whatever they wanted to. Women were even safe if they walked into a pub or bar to preach to some drunk or something. You know that? Or to bang their husband on the head with a frying pan. If anybody touched them or messed with them, there'd be 20 men that would knock them, knock them out. Women were safe wherever they went in America. Why were women safe? You need to stop. Every single psychologist and college professor and editor of a woman's magazine like Cosmopolitan, every one of these folks, every feminist, everybody needs to stop and ask me one question. Why is it that women could walk down the road at night and be safe in America? Why was that? They were 
domestic homemaking. They influenced from the cradle and as wives. But they were safe. Now today, woman has gained manly jobs. They have wages. They have lawsuits in their favor. They have voting rights. They are our judges and our policemen. And women are giving each other high fives and saying, we made it. But go turn the news on. Woman jogging down the road, raped, murdered, strangled. Betty and Fred, we just brought our, our, our daughter. We, we just said it's going to be okay but because she's just in the apartments down the road. We're just letting her go to college. We had no idea that somebody was going to knock on the door and say, policeman, open up. Being a 21-year-old girl, she opens up the door. She's raped and strangled and murdered. This happening all over the country. All over the place. Women are not safe. They're being brutalized by men that are out of control. So we need to ask a simple question. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? What did women have before that they don't have now? They had respect of men. Can I tell you something, the feminists of the early day of age, Susan B. Anthony, you know what she said? As they were launching their feminism in the late 1800s, she said, quote, and likewise a lot of other ladies, whatever we do when we're pressing for voting rights, Whatever we do, do not upset the balance of society that considers women to be a treasure to be put on a pedestal. Susan B. Anthony says, if we ever lose the respect of men, since they're the stronger creatures, we will be brutalized in society. And there's nothing that will stop men from brutalizing us. The only thing that preserves us is the sacred respect men have for godly femininity. The next generation of feminists said, we don't got to listen to those old-fashioned folks. We want to go for the gusto. We want it all. We can dance, smoke. We can get their job. We can do whatever we want. We can dress like a man if we want to. We can be objects. And then they lost the respective men. And you can try as hard as you want to teach a college boy to respect women when everything he's being taught from sun up to sundown is don't respect them, they're objects. Society is in a strange place. It needs Christian val- values to restrain the young man of today. But it doesn't want to use Christian values because they're old-fashioned and not up to date with our modern psychological mind. So they can't use Christian values, but somehow or another they're trying to say, look, you need to respect women. You, what's wrong with you? Maybe, maybe you don't have high enough self-esteem. And the, and the guy's like, no, i got high self-esteem. I, you know, I, I just wanted something and I took it. They're like, well, something's wrong with you. Maybe there's a chemical imbalance. Or something. How can we fix you? You can't fix little Johnny. See? Only God can fix little Johnny. And only God's ways can fix little Johnny. You left God's ways and society is reaping the consequences of it. I'm not justifying any rapist or murder. I, I, I'm probably worse than any. I believe many of them ought to get the death penalty. I, no, I'm not justifying what they're doing. i got little daughters, man. But I'm going to tell you something. You have to ask how we got where we are at today. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a very evil woman who wrote the woman's Bible, 
Here's what she said at the first feminist convention, though, in 1948. We have met here today to discuss our rights and wrongs civil and political and not as some have supposed to go into detail of social life alone. We do not propose to petition the legislator to make our husbands just, generous, and courteous, to seat every man at the head of the cradle, and to clothe every woman in male attire. As to their costume, the gentlemen need feel no fear of our imitating that, for we speak, think it in violation of every principle of taste, duty, and dignity. Do you hear that? The first feminist as evil as she was, said, don't think we're here to give up our long and flowing garments. No, no, we're, why would we want to put on your old rotten, silly garment? We don't want to walk around looking like you. We have the respect of our elegant garments. Why would we want to wear your garments? Notwithstanding all the contempt passed upon our loose, flowing garments, we still admire the graceful folds and consider our costume far more artistic than theirs. But women have lost the loose, flowing garments, haven't they? And they put on tight garments that do not flow, but simply reveal everything that should not be revealed. How Webb, Evangelist, said modesty, purity, grace, and the beauty of womanhood can be lost in the wearing of pants. The pants-wearing woman often becomes coarse, develops brazen mannerism, stances, and mannish actions. G.K. Chesterton. In the 1920s or 30s, what's wrong with the world? Because it is quite certain that the skirt means female dignity. Now, I'm not going as far as the Swazi uh, over in Africa that recently said, if you want to find out what's wrong with everything in the whole world, all the wars, everything, it's because women have put pants on, they need to put skirts on, and the whole world would... Now, I don't believe that. But that's how a lot of those folks feel in those tribes and, and folks in Africa. They feel that it starts at something so fundamental at the bottom, and the family crumbles. And then as the family crumbles, the rest of society crumbles. And they say it's almost like a domino effect. It trickles up. When, when women no longer dress like they are to be respected, then you've lost everything. That's where thinking comes from. So, so they're not as archaic as some folks are thinking they are. Um, We've lost the dress of dignity in the women today. Maybe it's because they've lost dignity. Maybe it's because they have lost the inner purity, the inner chastity, the inner um, grace that women are to have. And we need to get it back today. And Jesus will get it back to you, friends. In 1944, J. 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 G. Morrison said, instead of the noble chivalry that was the general characteristic of men of a generation or two ago, there is now an unaffected contempt for the female sex. With worldly styles of dress, many of Christ's women are now clothed with unabased effrontery. What's he saying? In 1944, he says, something's wrong with the men today. They're not respecting women anymore. And he says it's because, one of the reasons, is because of their dress. They no longer dress to be respected and treated as a special class. Hanton says, God never made anything more exquisite than, uh, exquisite than when he made consecrated womanhood. And therefore, the dewomanizing of modern woman is one of the most fundamentally disturbing of the latter-day portion. Why would women want to be dewomanized? Why would the vase want to come down off the pedestal and start bouncing all around the house? I can bounce all around. See, see, I won't break. See, I'm fine. See, see, I'm fine. You can kiss me. You can sit on me. Do whatever you want. See, I'm fine. I'm a bouncing vase. And then you want little Johnny, respect the little vase now, respect it, just bouncing all around, it doesn't make much sense, does it? Einstein said, 1938, I do not understand why women want to be so manlike. I think a womanly woman is one of the sweetest and most beautiful creatures God ever made. And even one of the modern introductory writers of the women's Bible, a blasphemous text, says throughout the 19th century women have been considered not only more spiritual but more naturally prone to piety and religious observance than man. So she wants everybody to know that uh, the women's Bible had some trouble. A lot of women didn't want to get, get involved with it. 
They said, no, no, uh, we, we want right, but you don't understand, you're messing up some things that, that we think are going to ruin society. You have to ask something, and I want you to reason a little bit here, just for a second. I've done an entire documentary on this thing almost, but uh, I just want to add something else here for you to think about. Why is it that American Indian women, a continent apart, separated from all of the known world, why is it when you get on a boat and you travel to this new world, separated from all humanity, the Indian women are walking around with long and flowing garments? What in the world? How can that be? Why is that? Is there not something innate in the very fact that a woman's form ought to be covered and she ought to wear graceful clothing? There must be something innate in us that tells us this. 1837 Prairie Expedition. The women wear their hair smooth, parted on the forehead and falling over the shoulders. They wear a little skirt of blanket or leather which they attach above the hips with a strap. Others wear a skirt separate from the waist. And in that case, the skirt is held in the same way, etc., etc. By For stockings, they wear embroidered leggings which come to the knee. For shoes, moccasins, on their backs, they wear either a blanket or a skin which covers them from head to foot. On the trail, they carry a baby, sometimes even two, inside the blanket on their back and supported by the top of the head. The women's costume is perhaps more picturesque than the men's. American Indians International History Project. At, at work, the women wore a wraparound skirt. The women's skirts are long and full. Uh, Indians of the Lower Hudson Valley up in New York. In warm weather, men wore deerskin breech cloth and women wore deerskin skirts, which reached below the knee. American Indian clothing says most Native American women wore skirts and leggings. Though the length, design, and material of the skirts vary from tribe to tribe, in other tribes, women usually wore one-piece dresses instead, like this Cheyenne buckskin dress. Here's a picture of that. Now, here's something interesting, is we have records of European women wearing ankle-length skirts going back to 600 B.C. That means over here in Europe, since 600 B.C., women have been dressing much the same way. And, of course, I believe for thousands of years before that. We're just talking about records here. You can go over to South America. The writer says the Peruvians come from the countryside to the city. And once they come out of the countryside, they almost immediately abandon the traditional rural costume. Long skirts and pigtails give way to stone white blue jeans, Michael Jackson t-shirts, and curly permanent. Permanent. Good old America, huh? Some older women still wear the traditional long skirts and aprons down here in South America. Isn't that something? A special came out to abcnews.com. They are amazed because 3,000 3, years ago, they found a 3,000-year-old mummy, is what I'm trying to say. Um, they dug up this mummy in China, 3,000-year-old mummy that lived around 1,000 B.C. She was buried in a red dress. And they're all amazed. Why was she in Western clothing? She must have migrated, they said. What is she doing there? Dressed in a dress. She, she's dressed like an American. What's that, you know, a, a modest American. What, what, what's going on? Like a 19th century American. How could that be? John Gill, old Baptist, says, to preserve chastity, this law in Deuteronomy seems to be made. And since in nature a difference of sexes is made, it is proper and necessary that this should be known by difference of dress, or otherwise many evils might follow. And this precept is agreeable to the law of light and of nature. So he's saying the law of light and nature tells you that women ought to dress a certain way to some degree. I told you about Daria Bowman in her book on how to give an office presentation. It says women don't wear pants or you won't be taken seriously. What is it in our society that looks at women that are dressed in an elegant way and there's just something about it and we're giving that up today in our home. So I'm calling you to one thing here. Modesty and dignity of dress that makes a woman lovely and modest. Not in a meretricious manner, but in a modest manner. 
You say, what will that give me? I don't know, but it'll make you pleasing with God, and it might, uh, if your heart's right, it might cause more prayers to be answered in your home and in our church. And the Bible teaches that feminine chastity has power over men to refine them. In 1 Peter 3, it says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, notice this now, be one. That means converted, influenced, changed by the conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. See, there's something about a chaste woman that has influence over a man. Yet women need to get that back. And it must begin in the heart. I mean, I've heard a woman say, you know what? I put a nice, sweet, modest skirt on, did my hair all nice and womanly, and my husband, you know, he never treated me any better. But you can't just dress outwardly different, see? You've you got to dress inwardly different. And some men are just evil, and, and they're not going to be changed by these things. It, this isn't something that's just going to be an automatic cure-all for everybody, but I'm going to tell you, it, it'll, we need to trust God and, and, and at least try it. And you don't want to manipulate your man to the wrong, uh, 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 to wrong end. This is simply for godly change and influence. But I think women need to obey First Peter and adorn themselves inwardly with this chaste conversation and godly fear. And then they need to adorn themselves outwardly, according to First Timothy, with this modest apparel. And I believe there will be more power over men, and we will get the respect from these young folks. And then we need to teach the young folks to respect. That they're dressed that way for a reason. You need to respect women, see. And that's a reminder. The way they're dressing is your reminder that you need to respect them. Remember what the children of Jacob said in Genesis 34. Did he deal with our sisters with a harlot? There ought to be a difference. Should there not be? The virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Notice the respect she has. We've lost that today. Somebody may say, well, what good would it do if you get every person that's here and every person that ever comes or listens to a CD from Kingdom Baptist Church, what good would it do to society? You know, you ever see that old... Uh, postcard or calendar or whatever it is where the guy's throwing oysters or clams or whatever it is off the beach back into the water, you know. And somebody says, well, what good is that going to do? There's thousands of them. And what does he say? He says, well, it made a difference to that one. You know, it made a difference to that one, didn't it? It may not make a difference to all these thousands, but it sure made a difference to that one that got thrown back in the water. You know something? You may not be able to save the world. I don't think you're going to save the whole world. In these perilous times. But Noah had enough sense to at least move with God here and save his house, didn't he? You can start right where you're at. Make a difference in your own child's life. Make a difference in some other child in Kingdom Baptist Church, can't you? And you might be surprised how far reaching your influence might end up being. I believe we ought to do all we can to set things back the way they should be. And young men need to be taught. And if God gives me a boy, I'm going to teach him. And I'm going to teach it from the pulpit that women need to be respected and honored. And you can't treat them like you treat the boys. You need to treat them with a certain degree of respect and honor. We should be courteous to everybody anyway. But you need to be extra courteous and special to the women. got a little time for some comments or questions before we end this thing. And I call for repentance if need be. 
Hopefully you've been encouraged to go do what's right. And all of this is to the glory of God that souls may be won and our nation set back right. Because folks need to be saved. And God says that it does matter how women dress. It does matter. Your heart's more important. But the outside's important too. And that needs to be taught in society. It, it's not this either or thing. See. Let's just concentrate on dress and forget the heart. So you can come in here and throw your Bible down and put your little things like this and poke your lips out and say, well, at least I'm modest, you know. No, that's not right. No wonder your marriage fails. That's not right. But I'm going to tell you something. Shouldn't we have? Should we just be right inside and not right outside? Does that make any sense? That's not right. If God said be modest, He wants you modest. And all these younger women need it. They need it so bad. They need godly examples. They're so beaten down by the world and, and they've got this, this other Antichrist message that's coming out. Now, these women need it so bad. They need godly examples. And I'm appealing to the women of Kingdom Baptist Church. If you're doing right, then keep on doing it. Praise God. But I'm appealing to you. Be modest and holy and pure. Not just for the women, for the other women that come in here, but also for the for the boys of this church, for the men of this church. So they should learn what women are. They, uh, most of the men in this church have not been raised respecting women. Do you understand that? That's a whole new idea. And the men need to learn that, that a woman is something different. I need to learn. We need to learn. Women are, women are different than men. They're a weaker vessel. You need to magnify their weakness and, and, and help them. Open the door. See them as queens. But women, if you expect to be treated as a queen, then you need to take the queen's position. See, you can't come down jumping and getting in faces and, 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 and like you got boxing gloves. You, you can't do that. See? All right, guys. Any comments or questions? God is good, isn't he? Praise the Lord. All right. Who's got a comment or question? Amen. They're going to go home and get their house in order. A few folks. Good. There's one. Well, Jeremy, that's, that, that's wonderful to hear, brother. But, uh, I, 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 you know, the women burning them is what we really want to hear. But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says, let your women keep silent. There's a certain amount of control that you need to take in your home. And I hold you responsible. If I see your wife's underwear, man, I hold you responsible. You understand that? I'm not going to look. I'm going to turn my head. But, man, I'm holding you responsible for what goes on in your home. If you can't fix that. If you can't check your wife when she comes out of the house and say, wow, we got bra straps, underwear lines, man, we got everything showing here, but come on to church, sweetheart. Now, if you can't check that, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's she going to do to you if you tell her the dress right? What are you afraid of? Is she going to beat you up? Because you asked her to, to dress right? What's going on? Well, I don't care if she dresses like that. Why don't you care? I don't understand that. Why don't you care? All right. Any other comments or questions? Miss Debbie, you got a sweet song? We can hear that good? I mean everything I said, though. Amen? 
It's always good having Mr. Deborah to come up here and sweeten it all up for us. So precious is Jesus, my Savior, my King. His praise all the day long, with rapture I sing. To Him in my wishes, for strength I can pay. For He is so precious to me. He stood at my heart's door, mid sunshine and rain, and patiently waited an entrance to gain. What shame that so long he entreated in vain. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Let's take up an offering. Brother Orlando, if you'll take one out there, brother, first for us. And, uh, and um, thank you for those of you that came through with Brother Bill Jackson. We still had a very low offering on Wednesday. So I hope we'll remember the house of God now and remember God's Word.